Good morning. Welcome to worship on this centen bicentennial weekend. It's been a busy weekend in, in many levels, so we thank all those who have been helping. We've still got stuff going on this afternoon uh, here at the church. There's baked goods for a free will offering. At 11 o'clock, there's a service at Riverbend Friends, which is just north of church on Evans on the left, and I will be involved with that, so I'll be busting out of here right after the, the service today. A um, few announcements to note today. The altar flowers are from Doug and Kathy Snyder in honor of their 47th wedding anniversary. Uh, we have several events that are happening and coming up. We, on August 4th, we're doing a vacation Bible school event that will last till 1 o'clock here at the church. On the 18th, we have our summer ice cream social, something new that we're going to try. We are still collecting for tickets for the Mud Hens game on August 24th. The deadline is the 4th. I know that seems way far away, but it's not. <laughs> so if you're going to attend that, please get your ticket money into Vicki Kirsch, and we'll get tickets for that. Um, Diane French has a new grandson. <laughs> Michael Weldon French, uh, July 17th, 6 pounds, 15 ounces. 19 inches, so good, good sized boy. Uh, thanks for those who have been helping with the, uh, all the projects that we did, the Tanzania project this past uh, week, and that, that went really well. We're still collecting school supplies. We don't need backpacks, but the supply list is there for you. Um, and today is also our God Works uh, Sunday that we help with that. Monday night is Theology on Tap. That happens at 6.30 at Tecumseh Brewing. Um, I think that's all the announcements. Any more? Okay, good. Let us enter into worship as we hear our prelude.
One additional announcement I forgot to note, uh, we have a member who's looking for a good used vehicle, so if you have uh, something like that, let me know. Please rise for the confession. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy, you are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. We sing our gathering hymn. pray. O God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people, that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Good morning. Good morning, Grandma. The first readings from Jeremiah 23, uh, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah prophesied before the exile in 587 BCE. In this passage, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd to describe the bad kings who have scattered the flock of Israel. God promises to gather the flock and to raise up a new king from David's line to save Israel and Judah. 
Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they, will, they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We'll read responsively. Uh, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall, I shall fear, fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all my days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from Ephesians 2, beginning with the 11th verse. The author of this letter reminds his audience that originally they were not a part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, they are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by him human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were without who were far off and have been brought by, near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you, are, you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, in villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Congregation may be seated. Have the children want to come up today? I don't know if we have any children here today or not. That's okay. We'll still have the children's sermon. <laughs> so we're, we're in this whole bicentennial thing and historical stuff. And as you know, um, our church was one of the original sites of a school. And, and if you remember your school days, one of the things you learned was nursery rhymes, right? Do you remember any nursery rhymes? Nobody wants to share them. I'll share one with you. Little Bo Peep had lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home bringing their tails behind them. That's kind of a gruesome, sad thing, isn't it? Let the sheep go. They'll come home. Doesn't matter. That's totally the opposite of what Jesus did, right? In the New Testament and parts of the Old Testament, sheep are mentioned 200 times. That's a lot for one subject. And the biggest one was the one we heard in our gospel today. They were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus went after them. The other one that I really like is that Jesus left 99 sheep to go get the one that had wandered off. When we're that one, it matters, doesn't it? It matters a lot. So ignoring those bad nursery rhymes, (laughs) focus instead on the good aspects of sheep in our gospel and what Jesus did for us as the good shepherd uh, and heals us and makes us one, makes us his dwelling place. Let's pray. We give you thanks, O God, for being among us as our shepherd, for being the one who comes after those of us who wander, and we do often. We give you thanks for being the one who rescues us, for it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our loving Savior, Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Author Paul Kahn, in a book that he wrote titled Making It Happen, tells an experience he had when he was living in Atlanta. One evening he was looking for a restaurant, and he saw this ad for an eatery that was called the Church of God Grill. And he wondered how this restaurant had been given such an unusual name, so he called and he asked, and here was their answer. Well, we had a little mission down here. We started selling chicken dinners on the church on Sunday to pay the bills. People really liked the chicken. We did such a good business, we decided to cut back on the church services and get more workers for the dinners. After a while, we just closed the church and kept serving the dinners. We kept the name we started with, so we became known as the Church of God Grill. Hmm. A church that died because the food was better than the faith. Compare that to the beginnings of the church that is described for us in our gospel. Jesus has gathered a small group and become a part of his spiritual family. There was Peter and Andrew and James and John and Philip and Nathaniel six of the 12 first disciples, or students of Jesus, as it literally translates. And this first group of believers had gone out to share the story of Jesus. Our reading for today from Mark is the account of them coming back from that trip. 
And they were no doubt anxious and excited to talk about their trip as well as being ready for a rest. And to meet those needs, Jesus takes them away from the crowds to a deserted place all by themselves to rest. For Mark records, many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And this passage records two characteristics of the first gathering of Jesus' followers. The first is that the early church had a reason for being. Mark wrote that the disciples gathered around Jesus. That's the first and most important reason for any church to exist, to gather around Jesus as a community of faith. Many today have this mistaken idea that they can live without the church. And I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning when I say this. But maybe you'll share it with those who aren't here on your Facebook page or social media. It's like that tired old example I've been thrown at over the years. But pastor, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Well, it's true at a certain level. You can experience God in other places than in church, but you cannot be a Christian and feel the love and support of a Christian community without being present, without being a part of it. It's like having a completely loaded luxury car with an empty gas tank. The car might look nice. It might have all the bells and whistles like power heated Cooled seats, a sunroof, premium Bluetooth connections, a stereo that will play whatever, GPS directions. It might do everything but diaper the baby. But if there's no gas in the tank, you ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere. You can call yourself a Christian. You might read the Bible every now and then. You might even consider yourself a good person. But if you're not part of a growing, supportive Christian fellowship, you are going to go nowhere for Jesus. Paul describes this well in that second lesson. Now in Christ you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then he describes what we're a part of. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets as Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord for which we have been built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. I like that. We are a dwelling place for God. God lives here, and God lives in us. And because God lives here and in us, this place and our lives, when we're not in this space, are to be sources of love and support and acceptance. And it's easy to do that when we're together. When we gather around this table where Jesus is with us, it's much tougher when we're out in the places where we live and work and play. Or at work or someplace and that off-color or racist joke is told, we know we should walk away. When we're at school and we see someone who is bullied and we know that we should step in and stop it. When we hit those struggles in our marriages and our difficulties and falling out with our families and we know that we should be the first one to offer forgiveness rather than sulk and break off ties. The second characteristic of that early church that speaks to us was that they welcomed the stranger. Jesus accepted interruptions. Even when the disciples and Jesus needed a break, even when they were whipped from all that they were doing, he changed his plans and they went ashore. And he saw a great crowd And he had compassion on them. Not pity, there's a difference. He had compassion on them. He felt with them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. 
Gee, that sounds like today, doesn't it? So many are like sheep without a shepherd, children who have no mentors or parents to guide them, people so soul-sick that they seek chemicals or sex or money or power to fill that void, the lost, the lonely, the hungry seekers, with no place to call home, those whose dignity has been stripped and destroyed. And Jesus was willing and able to change directions and go after those folks. To leave the 99 healthy sheep and go after that one that was lost. As the presence of Jesus in the world today, that's our job, brothers and sisters. One of the books I read a few summers ago was titled Letters to a Future Church. And it's a collection of letters of encouragement and prophetic appeals from church thinkers in various backgrounds. It was a little painful to read because it pointed out the things about the church and the pastors that we're not doing to reach the lost. Those who are not here on Sunday morning, which, by the way, amounts to 82% of the population now. There's only 18% of us that are going to church. One of the historical documents that one of our pastors found in the bicentennial materials was that when they had the first centennial 100 years ago, they had a big church service. Everybody was there except four. I wonder who those four were and how they knew who they were. It's changed. And reflecting in that, I close with a piece from that book that's titled Church is Hard by Jacob Waldron. Church is hard. It's hard for the person walking through the doors afraid of judgment. It's hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. It's hard for the prodigal soul returning home broken and battered by the world. It's hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together but doesn't. It's hard for the couple who fought the entire ride to church. It's hard for the single mom surrounded by couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. It's hard for the widow and the widower with no invitation to lunch afterwards. Church is hard for the parent of an estranged child. It's hard for the person singing hymns overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics. It's hard for the teenager wearing a scarlet letter ashamed of their mistakes. It's hard for the sinners It's hard for me. It's hard on the outside. It looks all shiny and perfect. Sunday best in behavior and dress. However, underneath those layers, you find a body of imperfect people, carnal souls, selfish motives. But here is the beauty of the church. Church isn't a building, a mentality, or an expectation. Church is a body. It's a group of sinners saved by grace living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters by love. Church is holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts, a training ground for mighty warriors. It is converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. It's a bearer of burdens and a giver of hope. It's family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes, rejoicing in in the smallest of victories. Church, the body, and the circle of sinners turned saints is where Jesus resides, if we ask. He is faithful to come. So even in the hard days, even the days when I'm at odds with a friend, when I fought with my spouse because we're late once more, when I walked into bearing burdens heavier than my heart can handle and masking the pain and the smile on my face, when I've worn a scarlet letter and I'm under the microscope, when I fought the tears as the lyrics are sung, when I walk back in afraid and broken after walking away, I'll remember. Jesus never failed to meet me here, here, the dwelling place 
for God. Please rise as you're able as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One in communion of the saints and the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. For the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, to the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy, peace, and love in your mercy. Amen. For the creation, cause new trees to be planted, restrain the melting of polar ice caps, save lands from destruction. Like a shepherd tends her sheep, raise us up from among caretakers that you have made in your mercy. For the leaders of nations and the heads of tribes, where peace seems far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony in your mercy. For the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors, heal those who are sick or in grief or struggling, especially Xavier, Randy, Stetson, Blaine, Rebecca, Charles, Fred, Sherry, Michael, May, Ken, Audrey, Nancy, Gary, Roger, Cheryl, Doug, Wayne, Todd, Rick, Wade, David, Brian, Bob, and Nan, Jim, Debbie, Donna, Juliana, Pastor Sarah, Pastor Hank, Christ Lutheran Church of Monroe, Pastor David Hively, and Lutheran lay Lutheran minister Wayne Butts, the family of Tanya Hansen, the family of Jim Hillsburg, the family of Larry Nickel, the people of Ukraine and the Mideast, and those impacted by weather events. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction, touch those with your tender care, and reach out to you in pain. 
and your mercy. For this assembly and for the faith communities represented this week at the ELCA Youth Gathering in New Orleans, nurture the faith of our young people as they encounter new experiences and people. Bring them safely home. Break down dividing walls and inspire collaboration among people of every age in your mercy. In Thanksgiving, we pray for those who have died in the faith. Make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. We share a sign of the peace. Puppy's gotta be on a leash. Margaret's gotta be. Uh oh. Oh, he's here. Oh, yeah. All right. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We feast on God's mill of love for us together. You may be seated.
please rise. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Now the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, you are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.